Okay, so here we are. Um, genetic technologies as a category, which I know a little bit about. Um, now, tomorrow, and in the next centuries. Um, okay, so I really want to talk with everybody rather than just talking at you. So I'm going to try and get through this fast, but I'm not very good at that. Okay, so what are genes? <laughs> um, let's talk what we're going to talk about. So genes are instructions, and they tell the body, and I can't see you all. Let me... Okay, now I can see you all, which will make me happier. Okay, so genes are instructions for making polypeptides, which are pretty much proteins um, with a little bit of extra stuff tacked on. Uh, the gene sequence for an organism is basically unique, um, and they are essential properties of who you are. If you had very different genes, you would be very different. You'd be a tomato or something else, not necessarily a tomato. Um, genes are not all expressed all the time, all in the same way in every cell and every individual. Um, and they're not even uniform throughout the organism. Your different cells have different DNA through mutations that just accumulate in different tissues. You are multitudes, which is really cool. Genes are also not the only feature of who you are. Um, even biologically, there's a lot more going on. Most importantly, this is a very common misinterpretation that we all fall into. Genes are not schematics. Genes do not have all of the information necessary to create an organism, period. Um, you could not just take DNA and 3D print an organism. That, that is insufficient information. Okay, so that's genes. What are genetic technologies? So genetic technologies are pretty diverse, but they're stuff we do with genes. One category is looking at stuff and figuring out what it does. Personalized medicine could look at someone's genome and develop specific drugs or things for them because of what how they respond to things. We can also um, observe the genetics of germ cells and decide which ones to uh, develop into full organisms. We can also mess with things nowadays. Um, gene editing takes the form of somatic gene therapies or germline. Germline is taking a single cell, changing its DNA, and then building your whole organism out of it. Uh, whereas somatic gene editing um, would be just taking a local region and somehow affecting this sub portion of the organism. Uh, we can just change how they're expressed without changing anything. And there's a lot of really crazy stuff that's cool. And I'm just acknowledging it exists, but I'm not going to talk about it. So present challenges. Uh, GMOs are really interesting and very powerful and the root of a lot of the progress in agriculture. Um, and they're also pretty much all of the economically important ones are owned by a very, very small set of organizations, which I find extremely dangerous. Um, another difficulty um, with genetic technologies comes from uh, genetic sequencing of individuals and the information that that can give them. I have a friend who was diagnosed with Huntington's disease, which completely changed their life and their expectations for their life and their decisions. Um, and it's not clear to her or to other people in her circumstances that she's talked with whether or not um, having that diagnosis improved her life. Um, this is a pretty straightforward but surprising example of just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, information is not always helpful or appreciated. Uh, so genetic screening is the poor man's super baby, but actually only available to rich people, really. Um, you can just t get a very, very large number of genetic possibilities, pick the ones that are desirable, and exclude potential persons from existing intentionally instead of accidentally. All right, so the near future, this is what we're here for. Um, De-extinction is becoming possible. We have genetic sequences of extinct creatures and we could try and recreate them. Um, if, so I said that DNA is not a schematic. 
just because we have DNA for the passenger pigeon doesn't mean that we can just create passenger pigeons with a 3D printer, but we have close relatives. And after some bootstrapping based on these close relatives, we could have a pigeon have a passenger pigeon DNA containing child, which would in great measure be a passenger pigeon, but would also bear some of the features of its parent because of the environment it developed in. For instance, you could not grow a passenger pigeon in the womb of an elephant. Um, and that's really actually important. Uh, there are organisms that we could not bootstrap. If we got the full sequence of a velociraptor, we would have to start with chickens and there's probably just too large of a gap. And so there'd be a very long process of slowly creating something velociraptor-like. Anyway, de-extinction is actually possible um, in the near future. Ethical concerns with de-extinction are where do we put them? There's a reason we killed all the passenger pigeons and it may have been a dumb reason, um, but where do we put passenger pigeons now? And other creatures who are much less prevalent than they were or extinct. Will rhinos be killed off again? Are we mostly doing a service to poachers if we de-extinct rhinos? Uh, and this is connected to something important, uh, I think, to our group of this idea of renewal and returning to a prior state. Is a prior state of the earth valuable uh, inherently? Do we have a responsibility to return things to a prior state? And what is the earth? And is the past earth real in the same sense that the current earth is real? And does it have rights to be restored? Okay, so GMOs and concentration of power too. Uh, in the future, there may be a vast democratization process where people can start making particularly microbes on their kitchen table, um, potentially making their own insulin on their kitchen table from yeast, possibly creating a new variant of smallpox. Um, concentration of power is really, really hard. And I don't have good answers. It's just really, really hard uh, and important. So I'd like to talk about that. Um, so personalized medicine and your medical records and, and intelligence agencies and how they have access to whatever they want because they're defending their country and everyone just bends yeah, over to do what they ask. Um, if we can develop personalized medicine, we can develop personalized pathogens, which is a potential tool that law enforcement will want. I'm just telling you scary things, sorry. But write down topics that you think are really interesting and we'll talk about them. Uh, again, gene therapy will become far more sophisticated, um, possibly creating real designer babies. Um, that has huge implications for, particularly for barriers to entry for those sorts of activities. Um, and possible futures, biodiversification is going to come up, I promise. Okay, so cloning um, is not that cool. It's pretty cool. It's not that cool. You're not going to run into your doppelganger because someone cloned you in a lab and accelerated your growth and implanted your memories, except maybe in the really far future. Um, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so corporate life. So if you think your boss is a problem now, what about if you were grown by your boss to be an experimental subject or just because they want slaves and like you don't have parents, they just created you. Our ethics are not prepared to deal with these sorts of challenges. Um, we don't have <laughs> categories to deal with these things about how when person and property start to get very, very similar um, and start to get entwined, um, and how much of the brain do we have to remove before they don't count as a legal person anymore and we can just do whatever we want to them? People are gonna be asking these questions and they're very dangerous questions, possibly even to ask. Uh, artificial biology is adding new, um, new elements to the genetic code, changing how things are expressed, creating new substrates for life. Um, we, we really can't anticipate how far life is going to go and how much we'll be able to describe it as life, but a lot of it will be relevant to biology. And again, I, I bring this up because it will defy categories that we currently have. Um, 
ecology is definitely going to change in the distant future. Um, so that, yeah, this is what you all came for probably. I don't know if this is what you came for, but anyway, this is what I advertised, biodiversification. Um, as we develop genetic technologies that are tremendously powerful, we can start adding back diversity into populations that have been hunted or otherwise bottlenecked into having reduced genetic diversity. We can increase the rates of mutations. We can do all sorts of manipulations. We can de-extinct entire ecosystems that didn't exist um, or haven't exist for a long time and bring them back. Uh, it's biodiversity can be a manufacturable resource in the future. An important feature of ecology of the future is that it really won't be ecology as we know it anymore. Um, ecology and other ethics that drive our approach to the sciences um, are, in my estimation, uh, value-laden, that ecology approaches questions with an assumption of what the right sorts of answers are going to look like. Um, and with an, I, most importantly, that's also not to imply that they're dishonest scientists. Um, because engineers go about doing their work with the intention to make things that do things that are valuable according to their value system. Um, ecology uh, approaches these questions with some assumptions about what humanity's place is in solving these problems as a guardian, as a protector, as someone who should shove off. Um, but ecology is approaching these questions largely from an ethical standpoint. Um, about what we ought to be doing and how we ought to be preserving these things and that we ought to be preserving these things. There aren't ecologists that advocate for getting rid of large types of wildlife. Um, there's the concept of regulation, but there are very, very few ecologists that would call for um, bringing any species to extinction. Um, there, there are a few. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of feeling that we need to not have invasive species um, because they do things that we inherently see as damaging. But a lot of the categories for describing things, invasive species, extinction, um, are value-laden concepts. Uh, invasive species are just bad. So um, we need an ethics of the future, um, inspired by the fact that as our powers increase, we may need to rethink what we considered good. This is where I think um, religious transhumanism can provide important insights because of this feature that we have it where we're informed by faith traditions. And faith traditions, especially Mormon faith traditions, uh, consider the ethics of vastly powerful beings that are human. Uh, our God is essentially a human god um, and human like us and human like our future and we need to be thinking about these ethics that we would be abiding by um, and that's resulted in some interesting thought um, when we're trying to figure out what our faith traditions say about the ethics of gods that we're going to have to start worrying about as our power extends to rewriting ecologies um, vastly modifying organisms, possibly removing their capacity for suffering, changing what they rely on nutritionally. Um, we need to figure out what our traditions that we're drawing on are saying and should be understood to be saying. Um, so th the typical ethics of faith could be loosely drawn into commandments um, that You've been told to do things, and those are the things that are right. It's very deontological. Do this, don't do that. You get um, New Testament enhancements and refocusings that I really like, but they're still commandments. They're still two great commandments and so forth. Um, it's pretty straightforward to say, yeah, these ethics ought to apply to us. We ought to be considering these things. It may not be trivial to update them. Uh, a, a category that the MTA is very fond of believing in is aspirational ethics that oh there's a prophecy we should go do that um, and that's that's actually very challenging to 
uh, to interpret that, oh yeah, the prophecies were given by God to tell us what to do in the distant future. Um, there are folks that hold this position and I, I think pretty much appropriately um, because these good prophecies that we like uh, are stating that there are things that are good that God would do and that we therefore ought to do should that become possible. And there are also folks that are horrified by this and would ask that we stop playing at being gods. Um, and I, I, I tell them to pay a little more attention in Sunday school, but their point is, is well taken. Um, the LDS traditions, um, well, the Mormon traditions, uh, as I've explained before, have a lot to say about this idea of just, it's our job to create worlds. And so should we start creating worlds as soon as we can? All right, there we go. So I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, let's talk a little bit. So we got a chat. Richard, we, um, can you hear me? I can now, Ben. So we, it's time for a break now, but it's lunch yeah. break. So if people want to, they can. If they want to hang in here and ask questions, that's totally appropriate also. Um, I'll just formally kind of close this and thank Richard for a great presentation. And then everyone is welcome to stick around here and ask questions. And then we'll be reconvening in about 20 minutes in the main hall. So, All right. thank you, Richard. All right, Jesus, amen. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, yeah, so we've got questions. So would people really mind if mosquitoes went extinct? Um, this is a huge thing for ecology. There's this mindset that we need to be really, really careful about what chunks of our system we just punch out because they're really inconvenient and they don't achieve values that we like. Um, and we should probably remember that uh, cows would probably like to just kick out humans because would any cow really mind <laughs> if all humans went extinct? Um, so, uh, robotanist, thank you, Sage. Uh, mosquitoes are important. Um, a question, could we modify mosquitoes to be less harmful to things that we value? Um, and as uh, David Pierce briefly asked in his slides, is a lion a lion if it's not just totally wrecking things all over the place? So is a mosquito a mosquito if it's not sucking human blood and passing disease? Uh, and is an alternative definition of mosquito as something that does all that but doesn't pass disease or irritate my skin uh, a fair thing for us to impose? So yeah, but uh, malaria kills a lot of us and I value human life a lot. So yeah, we have lots of discussion on mosquitoes and cows. Very good. Uh, if anyone wants to wave at me or unmute and just ask a question or talk about a thing. We've got, I proposed a billion topics. So let's look at genetic technologies um, and appropriate use of genetic technologies rather than necessarily uh, extinctioning things. Talk about de-extinctioning things. Do we need saber-tooth cats? Well, no, we need and all the suffering that they would add. Jurassic Park. This has got to happen eventually. <laughs> yep, prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, there are plenty of uh, amazing things we can do with it. I actually um, think de-extinctioning is one of the less interesting ones, honestly. Um, we can certainly get a lot of information about species that went before, but what we can do with biotechnologies that goes along, especially in terms of things like industry and developing life to produce all of the things that we're currently having to do with car complex and difficult to reproduce machines uh, is going to be exceptionally valuable. Uh, we've already begun to see it with microorganisms, which we can get to produce things like artificial oil. Yeah, I um, suppose the use of other organisms as instruments for achieving our objectives is kind of hard for a human to avoid doing. That's a lot of stuff that we do 
is just oriented around making things that we like happen. And depending on how cynical and reductionist you want to be, you can even say like, oh yeah, we bring animals into our homes so we can love them, which is just this purely instrumental use. And like, love is just an object that we're trying to maximize. And cats or dogs help us maximize our love expression value. Should we be looking at life as a tool um, and as a machine? Well, I would argue that, uh, yes, it's a specialized machine. I mean, right down to the human body, which uh, we should certainly assign a uh, high value to uh, as a complex machine that can do things and has a special place among the hierarchy. But ultimately, it's a bunch of chemistry doing very uh, specific tasks and coming together to achieve a particular goal of surviving and reproducing. That's what life has done, and that's what it can do. Life and, you know, uh, we don't understand necessarily how all of it works, but then as far as we do continue to understand more and more of it, it all comes back to that same basic concept of machinery. And you could easily demonstrate this with any particular cell. Fact, um, we have cells and they do things like kill themselves off and build this structure, do that. They have very specific programming in the DNA points further to this idea. Yeah, um, I think I would categorize that as the argument that, well, biology is machines. And so it would just be responsible to see it as what it is. So I think that's a fair capture of a short version. Sure, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, does anyone want to uh, pretend to be someone who disagrees that biology is a machine that uh, in the same way that we think of machines? Or... I, I think that's useful in certain circumstances, but in the wider ecology, I think that'd be so tough to manage because uh, like, there's so many influences on any ecosystem that you know, if, if we do you know, make some kind of machine, like it killing off all the other things that we need to eat or breathe or whatever, you know, could be pretty devastating. And I don't see how, especially at least here on earth, we could engineer everything. I don't know. Maybe that could be possible at some point, but at least right now, I don't think we even have close enough to an understanding to pull that off. Yeah. I, I tried to present three time periods in my slides to capture that idea that in the very distant future, we may be able to start considering ecologies as machines that are internally managed, um, that we can understand and really deeply manipulate, but we that's certainly not even in the near term, except perhaps in highly controlled ecologies. So in your desktop bioreactor where you're producing insulin in five, 10 years. Um, so artificial ecologies uh, more naturally match this model of machine, I think. Well, that is more or less where my particular interest focus is trying to get entire artificial ecologies to function. So yeah. uh, maybe that colors my thinking somewhat. I don't know on the... <laughs> that entirely. Yeah. But it seems that, especially since these ecologies are made up more than anything by single celled organisms, mm -hmm. um, that the most basic machinery sense would make particular sense um, because cells really are just responding to the most basic of signals and they're very fundamental in their components. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. Fundamental in terms of scale, um, and we've managed to find their fundamental fun, the components of these fundamental components. Uh, but there is uh, metabolism still are mind-bogglingly complicated to me. <laughs> That's only a twenty-step. Yeah, you know. <laughs> All right, uh, another thing, let's just random categories in here. Um, oh, John. Yeah, so about the whether or not 
we consider uh, life to be the equivalent of something machine or at least machinic. Um, do you think the distinction between viruses, which are often presented as non-living entities, and uh, I guess all other forms of life, uh, can that be an intellectual tool we could use to go and think about when we're dealing with something that's truly mechanical and when we're dealing with something that might have some kind of ontological difference and therefore maybe some kind of different ethical responsibility towards? I feel like that's a really good extension of Ben's what talk. The, the what? Name of the bear in Jungle Book. Oh. Sorry, I was. No, but he's got to run. <laughs> uh, no, can you repeat the question? I I missed it. Yeah. Um, John, can you muse at that direction? Uh, looking at multiple categories of life, not just like the animal life and consciousness and experience, but even categorizing. The virus is as life or non-life oh, right. and right we look a lot more machine-like and do we have right. this continuum of machine-like to creature-like or are there so, various like sharp lengths sharp breaks we could go in and identify like the virus uh cell division right so yeah i've i've put some thought in this um so descartes thought that animals are you know just machines and then you know if you, few centuries later we've realized okay maybe he wasn't quite right about that um i think we should have an open mind about whether viruses can feel um oh. sorry yeah yeah i was just wondering um we're working on the consciousness survey project at canonizer building consensus around the best theories of consciousness and there's an emerging camp now being called representational qualia theory but basically it's just the general idea that everyone pretty much is unanimous agreement even dennett's predictive bayesian coding theories is supporting subcamp of that but basically it has the idea that when you look out in the world and you perceive the world there's like a diorama of knowledge in your brain and half of that diorama is in your left hemisphere and the other half of that diorama is in your right hemisphere so if you have a knowledge of a red strawberry in your right hemisphere and a green leaf in your left hemisphere, the corpus callosum is binding those together so you can be aware of both the redness and greenness in both hemispheres. And V.S. Ramachandran was the first one to propose using a, a corpus callosum-like bundle of neurons to connect multiple brains together. And this was portrayed in the movie Avatar where they had the, the neural ponytails where you could connect it together, which would enable the computational binding of consciousness so basically if you're hugging your loved one you can only feel half of the sensations but if you could have a computational binding there then instead of just two bound hemispheres you could have four bound hemispheres and you could feel all of the experiences as you hugged your um loved one instead of just half and also if they have it inverted red green qualia you would quickly notice that and say oh your redness is like my greenness but anyway i wonder if you guys had any thoughts along that kind of stuff um, and along with genetic technologies, particularly. Um, yeah. Uh, gen engineering such an organ um, is probably really hard. But genetics would probably be the level you'd want to. No, oh, maybe that would be a level you'd want to go in. I, I think I would uh, initially prefer to use an electronic interface, but. That's my field of research. So. What do you think course, about, oh, go ahead. Yeah, what, so in other words, you say electronic. So a key part of that is the binding, the computational mm -hmm. binding. If something is computationally bound into your conscious awareness, you are aware of it. And so, and, and, and in other words, the binding problem, that's the hardest part. And, and so so it sounds like you're saying that that electronics could achieve that kind of binding rather than some uh, yeah if we I, I tend to look at the body of the machine I fall into the machine camp very squarely and its magic is that uh, the brain is aware of the stuff in it that's in it and if you can tell the brain that it's two brains it'll be aware of the stuff that are in both brains that would be my guess um, I want to, because we're really close to the end of our break, I want to talk a little bit about what ecologies should exist, because this is a question 
that it becomes possible to ask. And it's important to biodiversification is an ideal ecology, one with radical diversity and radical mutation rates. Is it an ecology that serves some aesthetic purpose to the highest conscious beings that exist, obviously us and mosquitoes. Um, what ecologies should we have and what ecologies are bad and shouldn't exist and shouldn't have lions killing other stuff? If we get to start making choices, what is a worthy ecology? It seems like prima facie, I'm pretty um, resistant against the possibility of modifying ecology in a way, um, in any way, like in any substantial way in terms of like, you know, modifying the actual genetics of organisms before we actually understand what the mental states mm -hmm. of those organisms are like. So unless we understand what suffering is for them, unless we have like very high confidence that we understand that, I would say that I'd be pretty resistant towards, you know, actually like modifying animals in mass or completely radically changing ecology. And so I would, I would tend towards being like a proponent of inertia and in that like we should try to avoid changing ecology as much as possible from like its evolutionary basis like, you know for example by reducing pollution and climate change um, and we can eventually maybe modify ecology dramatically to improve the mental states of animals only once we have the confidence that we actually understand those mental states we've got a mean question for you so so future ecologies don't exist yet um mm -hmm. And unless you take a really weird view of history, um, future ecologies don't exist and we get to influence how they happen is uh, humans butt out, stop interfering with stuff, let evolution happen, re reverse climate change. Uh, are ecologies that spontaneously develop in, in some circumstance or another superior? Uh, if there isn't one that is well, yeah, this is the one where humans weren't involved. This is the one where humans are involved. Are there any ecologies that are superior to other ecologies, particularly based on their evolutionary history? Yeah, that's a good I'm, question. Oh. I'm not sure how that's mean. <laughs> but. Oh, yeah. It's just saying like, oh, I disagree. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that like humans are part of nature. Like we like to think we're some mm -hmm. separate entity, but like we are part of that ecosystem. And so like, you know, it. I, I don't think we're doing any favors by saying, oh, like, uh, you know, humans are making unnatural decisions. Like we are by definition part of nature. Um, right. Yeah. yeah, that's the hard bit. Uh, is a global warmed globe better or worse? Is the tremendous loss of diversity actually loss of diversity? Um, or just a different diversity? I, I mean, I do um, think that yeah. like it is, extremely bad like and we should, we, yeah we are like morally obligated to do something about it um climate change um and yeah like yes um but like i also agree with what jeremy was saying like um like we only have started to understand a lot of these systems uh, that have been in motion for millions, if not billions of years. Um, so like we should be very careful, especially when it comes to the genetics. Um, like we might think, oh, there's a gene for switching off pain or intelligence, but like there might be side effects for that. It's not like mm -hmm. there's one-to-one -one mappings between yeah. a gene and a, and a phenotype. So um, like we should be really careful. I like David yeah. Pierce's timeline of like a thousand years for some of these things um, but in the near term like i think if we do understand the science well enough for climate change for example which i we do um yeah I, at least i think we do um and we decide we want to do something about that like yeah i'd be much more inclined to do to take action there um in the near term yeah and the stability uh bias for the near term yeah, humans really like the status quo. Um, mm -hmm. It's not terribly surprising. It's what we came into, and it's certainly um, how we tend to operate best. Uh, but there is something to be said for uh, the Earth and being in a constant state of change. It always has been. Um, in fact, we wouldn't even be doing what we're doing right now if it hadn't been basically warming somewhat on its own since the last ice age. Yeah. or if that ice age hadn't come and forced us into a different position, or if life itself hadn't made huge alterations to the climate throughout Earth's history, which allowed life as it currently exists to be. 
So, um, you know, we can make certain an argument that uh, this may be an ideal situation if that's what humans want to stick with, but we can also look at significant potential benefits coming out of it or the fact that the change is necessary to keep life and ecology and everything else going in a positive direction. Right. I think with if we look at the two different futures for the end of the century and see like, like oh, one where it's gone up four degrees Celsius and air pollution is terrible, like versus we've kept it relatively the same, like I think you could make an argument that there'd be less suffering and more happiness in that second scenario. But like you said, like, you know, there are other parameters um, that we could, we should keep in mind. Um, and like, if, like, it's not just about temperature. So. Yeah. No, and sometimes, uh, you know, yeah, suffering is a necessary part of these things. Um, we have mass die-offs and immediately after we have huge new uh, changes in biodiversity, life going in whole different directions, uh, dealing with these um, new scenarios and opportunities that it has. And that has resulted in all kinds of advances, I guess you'd call them in life, and uh, approaches. So um, is it right of us then to shut that down permanently? Or are we now the cause of it because we're doing what we want to do? We are, you know, the drivers of a new uh, shift in uh, the next step, I guess, in evolution or ecology. Thanks everyone for a great, for a great session. Thanks yeah. again, Rich, for doing yeah. this. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, thanks all.